Okay. Go ahead and get your uh, last name into the uh, Socrative thing. Okay, so last chapter, we talked about bone tissue. Like, um, how does bone tissue work? <clears throat> In this chapter 7, this is all about the skeleton. So it's all about the specific bones of the, um, of the body. And unfortunately, this is one of these topics that it's very difficult to make interesting in lecture. So it's, I'm kind of apologizing in advance. This, the skeleton lecture is a little dull. <laughs> and there's kind of no way around that. I want you to see the bones. I want you to hear the names of the, uh, the bones and their features you know, so that you can audibly hear that. But you know, let's face it, the skeleton is just one of those things you kind of have to learn on your own you know, because it's memorization. But what I handed out earlier um, is the bone study guide. So anything I'm going to ask you about bones is going to be from this list, both in lecture and in lab. So it's the same material, same information. We're going to be looking at it in both places. So um, these are the bones and the bone features um, that I want you to know. Does anybody still need one? Yeah. All right. <clears throat> So this is the what you're responsible for out of the uh, skeleton. <clears throat> All right. So like everything else um, in anatomy, when, we're, when we deal with a big thing with lots of parts, we divide it up. So for the skeleton, we divide the skeleton into the axial skeleton and the appendicular skeleton. Appendicular <laughs> as in appendages. So the arms and legs are in one category. And the center, or the axial skeleton, is, in, is the other. So um, in yellow here is the axial skeleton made up of the skull um, that's, uh, and the associated bones of the skull. So that's 29 bones. We're going to start um, with the skull here in a minute. The thoracic cage is 24 ribs and a sternum. Um, so this is protecting the, uh, the heart and the lungs as well as um, the liver and spleen, which kind of sit up here underneath the, uh, the ribs at the bottom. And then the vertebral column, or the spinal column, um, is 26 bones of uh, vertebrae, sacrum, and coccyx. So all told, the axial skeleton is 80 bones. Um, and most of those, um, uh, uh, well, they're sort of evenly distributed, really, between the skull, the thoracic cage, and the vertebral column. All right. So the components here, um, the skull, the vertebral column, and then the thoracic cage, these are protection bones for the most part. I mean, yes, the vertebrae uh, do support the weight of the body, but for the most part, these axial skeleton uh, bones are designed to protect things that are delicate. You know, so up here in the cranium is the brain, so we have this bony uh, case protecting it. In here are the very soft, squishy lungs, um, which uh, need bony protection as well. And then also, the broad, flat surfaces of the um, axial skeleton provide a great place for muscle attachment. Um, so the principal muscles that move the arms and legs actually attach to the axial skeleton, as we'll see when we get to the skeletal muscle uh, chapter here in a little while. All right, so first up is the skull. Complicated, complicated, complicated. Um, in so many ways, the best way to learn about a, the skull is to have one in your hand. Um, so I'm going to encourage you in lab, we have lots of different skull models, um, to, to learn it that way. Because learning it from pictures, you can sort of get an idea, but not like you can holding it in your hand. Um, <clears throat> so we divide up the bones of the skull into the cranial bones and the facial bones. The cranial bones surround the brain, so that's their job. It's, it's the brain's built-in helmet, the cranial bones. And then hanging down from the front of the cranial bones are going to be the facial bones, the bones that make up what we consider the face when we look at it. So we have eight cranial bones and 14 facial bones. And then we have these seven associated bones. What we mean by that is these are bones that are not directly a part of the skull, but they are found there. So in each middle ear, there are three tiny little bones called ossicles. And because we have two ears, that means that there are six of those. 
We're going to learn about those, well, you'll learn about those in Chapter 17, which is in the next unit about special senses. And then the other associated bone is the hyoid bone, which is um, a bone that it's interesting because it doesn't connect to any other bone. It's called the floating bone, so we bone like that at the body. Um, but it is the site of attachment for many of the muscles of the, uh, of the pharynx or the throat. So like when you swallow, you can um, sort of feel that hyoid bone go up and down. It's, it's up in here, but we'll look at that later. All right. But first up, <clears throat> the uh, bones of the skull. So the cranial bones, we have um, one, two, three, four of them are unpaired. So we have one occipital bone in the back. We have one frontal bone in the front. Um, we have one sphenoid bone, which is sort of in the center of the skull. We'll talk more about the sphenoid later. Um, but if you think, if the skull has a center three-dimensionally, that's the sphenoid. And then one ethmoid bone, which is part of uh, what makes up the bony uh, division between the two nostrils or the nasal septum. And then we have two parietal bones, one on each side, and we have two temporal bones, one on each side. <clears throat> and all together, these eight bones surround the brain, so we call those the cranial bones. And then for the face, we have a maxilla on each side. The maxilla is here in orange. And your book um, tries to keep the uh, colors consistent from picture to picture, so that while you're looking at the skull from different angles, uh, like the frontal bone will always be this color, the temporal bone will always be this color, is kind of a visual clue for you. All right. Um, the, uh, well, we'll look at those later. Okay. <clears throat> so where the bones of the skull, where the cranial bones come together, is a special kind of a bony joint called a suture. And uh, uh, so we can see that, like, here's the temporal bone and here's the parietal bone. And then where they join together is this kind of twisty, turny, um, uh, interlocking fingers of bone. So that's what we call a suture. The bones of the skull actually develop separately, but then they grow into each other and sort of lock in tight to form a continuous bony covering over the brain. So the sutures are where the bones of the cranium come together. And each of them has a special name. So where the temporal bone, right here, <clears throat> joins with the parietal bone, which is right here, we call that the squamous suture. So this is the squamous suture right here. Squamous means flat. And when you feel this uh, suture in the, a lab, you'll feel that it has kind of a flatness to it because the uh, temporal bone kind of overlaps the parietal bone, almost like shingles on a root. So it's very flat. So that's the squamous suture. Where the frontal bone and the parietal bone join together, <clears throat> that's the coronal suture. Now, corona means crown. So you imagine that in the old days, they wore uh, the queen wore a crown that kind of sat on the top of her head like this, you know, kind of like a, a headband would today. Well, that's where that coronal suture is, where the frontal bone and the parietal bone join together. So it's, it sits like this. Uh, that's the coronal suture. The, um, um, and then at the back, we have this uh, uh, where the occipital bone at the back here joins with the parietal bones here. We call this the lambdoid suture. Why? Because this shape right here, this sort of three-pronged uh, shape, it looks like the Greek letter lambda. So um, they call this where the occipital and parietal bones join. That's the lambdoid suture right there. And then where the parietal bones join each other on the top, we call that the sagittal suture. So remember that the sagittal plane is one that divides a person into left and right, a left half and a right half. Well, the sagittal suture goes along that same plane. So it goes along the top of the head um, from front to back. Um, and we'll see pictures of these uh, sutures as we go through the bones of the skull. All right. So if we look head on, what, mostly what we see here are facial bones. Um, so we have the big frontal bone here, in the, which is a cranial bone. But then below that, um, we have the nasal bones. These make up the bony part of the nose. So if you feel the top of your nose, those are the nasal bones. 
these are, those are what can get broken. You know, so if you get punched in the nose or you fall down and hit your face, the nasal bones can actually get broken and can twist the whole uh, nose sort of out of alignment. Um, the maxilla makes up a great deal of what we uh, consider to be the face. You know, so when we look at somebody, a lot of what we're seeing is frontal bone and maxillary bone and then mandible or um, uh, the jaw bone down here at the bottom. Um, the bone that creates the cheek ridge, that's the zygomatic bone here in blue. And then as we look down into the eye socket and into the uh, uh, nasal cavity, we see lots of different bones. Um, so like we have the sphenoid sitting here at the back. The ethmoid um, is this bone here. The vomer comes up from the bottom, but you see those better in um, other views. All right, so that's the skull from the front. From the back, we have our two parietal bones, so one on the left, one on the right. We have our big occipital bone. Um, here's that lambdoid suture right here connecting the two. The sagittal suture um, connecting the top, uh, the two parietal bones at the top. Um, so sort of a boring view. Most of what we see here is occipital bone. Um, temporal bone on the side, parietal bones at the top. This is a good view of the skull because it shows lots of different um, uh, bones. Um, so this is from the side. And here you can see that the frontal bone joins the parietal bone. Remember, there's a parietal on each side. It's uh, not, or it's paired. Here's the temporal bone. The temporal bone is where the ear hole is, so the um, acoustic meatus. And just behind the acoustic meatus, there's this kind of bump or bulge that sticks out from the bottom of the temporal bone. That's your mastoid process. You can kind of tap on it and it has a kind of hollow sound to it. And it's because it has some air spaces in it that help us to hear better. So that's the mastoid process. Um, let's see. The uh, zygomatic bone, the um, sphenoid, again, you'll see little bits of the sphenoid in lots of different pictures of the skull. But the best way to think of it is that the sphenoid is in the very center and all of the other bones attached to it. So the sphenoid bone is uh, sort of the center of the skull. If we look at the corner of the eye sockets, we'll see the lacrimal bones. These are very thin, very delicate bones that protect the, um, the tear ducts. So lacrima is tears, so the lacrimal duct is the tear duct. And these tiny little thin bones sit over that tear duct and protect it uh, from the inside. So lambdoid suture, squamous suture, coronal suture. Right. So the uh, best way to see the internal bones of the skull is to look at it in, uh, in uh, a mid-sagittal section or a division into left and right. So here we've split the nose down the middle. And now we can see the bones that make up uh, what we call the nasal septum. Septum means wall. And the nasal septum is what divides the left side of the nose from the right. So, you know, we have two nares, two nostrils, and between them is this wall. And the bony, the bony part of that wall is made up of the ethmoid bone hanging down from the top and the vomer, which is sort of sticking up from the bottom. Um, so the two of those together make up the, the bony part of the nasal septum. Here's the sphenoid again, um, very much in the center. Um, and then if we look at the, uh, the roof of the mouth, we can see that most of the hard palate is made by the maxillary bone, which is always an orange, but the back, about a third of it, is made by the palatine bones. Um, so the palatine bones make up the, the back part of the hard palate that divides the nasal cavity from the uh, oral cavity. All right. Um, on the inside, the temporal bone not only has the external auditory meatus, meatus just means hole or gap, but it also has the internal acoustic meatus where the nerve from the inner ear actually goes into the brain. So the entire uh, ear system is encapsulated in the temporal bone. So um, the, uh, uh, the temporal bone contains not only the hearing part of the ear, but the equilibrium part of the ear too. So we have an internal and external auditory meatus. Okay. Probably the most complicated view of the skull is this one, looking at it from the bottom. And here again, in lab, I would encourage you to do this. 
because there are lots of little nooks and crannies and lots of uh, um, features that can be named. Now, I didn't give you very many on your list, um, but uh, you know, if, if you were going to go into um, uh, like uh, ear, nose, and throat work, you'd have to know all of these little holes and, and, and patterns. But for now, the uh, roof of the mouth is mostly maxilla, so that's here in orange again, right? So the upper teeth actually insert into the maxillary bones. There's a left and right maxillary bone. And then the bottom teeth, of course, insert into the mandible or the jawbone. So here are those palatine bones at the back, zygomatic bones making up the cheek uh, bone. Here we can really see the sphenoid, which is in purple. Um, so, and I've got an even better picture of it coming. Um, you can see the giant foramen magnum. This is where the uh, spinal cord emerges from the base of the skull. Um, and the uh, occipital condyles here are where the skull sits on the top of the vertebral column. Um, and they're smooth because like, you know, we can uh, say yes with our head. So that means that the skull has to rotate on that, um, these occipital condyles. There are these two sharp little points. They very much look like fangs on the bottom of the skull called the styloid process. And this is a spot where um, many important muscles attach to the skull, particularly um, the muscles of the, uh, of the pharynx. The uh, jugular foramen is here. This is where the jugular vein comes out of the skull. And very round hole on both sides called the carotid canal is where the carotid artery enters the skull. So we have blood going in, we have blood coming out through those um, uh, foramen. A foramen is just a hole, a canal is a, is a longer hole. Um, <clears throat> let's see, one those. Okay, if we look down into uh, the inside of the skull, um, we can see that we have three uh, big areas. So we have um, an anterior fossa, a middle fossa, and a posterior fossa. The brain basically sits on this platform that we're looking at. Um, at the uh, very front is the ethmoid bone. The ethmoid bone is uh, easy to spot because it has, always has a bunch of little holes in it. The reason for that is the nerves that um, provide us our sense of smell pass through these little tiny holes and into the top of the nasal cavity. Um, so um, the, uh, we call that the ethmoid plate. Um, uh, the, here is the sphenoid bone, again in purple. It has this very complex shape. And right about in here is where the pituitary gland sits. Um, and it sits in what's called the cella tersica. This translates into Turkish saddle. And when you look it down into the, the skull and lab, I think you'll see why. Because it, it looks like if you took a little person, you could sit them in this saddle, and one leg would go down this way, one leg would go down this way, and it would look like you were riding a horse. So this uh, region right here is called the cella tersica. So I'll show you that more in lab. All right. All right, and here's that sphenoid bone. The sphenoid bone is my favorite skull bone. <coughs> so if you're going to get asked a question about one, this is, you're probably going to hear about the sphenoid because it's really cool looking. Um, <coughs> it's shaped a little bit like a butterfly. Um, so it has a greater wing um, that's here and here, and then it has um, a lesser wing uh, that's um, on the on the inside here. <coughs> so it sits kind of like a bird in the middle of the skull, <coughs> and it's uh, the uh, attachment for many of the other bones of the skull. So um, it's hard to visualize again. I'll, I'll show you in lab. I have a really cool exploded skull um, where you can see how all the parts come together because all the bones have been taken apart, but they're um, still oriented. So. You'll see when we get there next week. All right. Let's skip that one. All right. So which of the following bones is paired? Oh, I have a second question. So while you're thinking, there we go. Now it should be coming out to you. 
right, good. So which of those is paired? That's going to be the temporal bone. So we have a temporal bone on the left and right side. All of those other bones are unpaired. They're singular. Now, the maxilla um, starts as two bones, um, but it grows together um, in the center. So in the adult, anyway, the maxilla is just one bone, not two. All right. Which of the following is a facial bone? Because remember, in the skull, there's cranial bones, facial bones, and associated bones. Jump in there, last few people. All right, so which of those is a facial bone? The maxilla. You know, the maxilla really makes up the, the middle third of the face. You know, when you think of a face, the middle third of it is maxilla and um, zygomatic bones that make the cheekbones. The top part of the face is all frontal bone, one big frontal bone. And then the bottom part of the face is all mandible. All right. The sagittal suture is located between which two? All right, so the sagittal suture, remember the sagittal plane divides a person into left and right. So the sagittal suture is between the two parietal bones. So if you were to look at the top of the skull, um, what you'd see is sort of a line down the middle, and that's the, the sagittal suture. Well worth learning the sutures, because they're, they're easy answers if you know the, the names of the sutures and what bones they're between. Um, we use the sutures as landmarks on the skull. So like when we're talking about skull anatomy, like say somebody has fallen down and they've got a skull fracture. You're probably going to use the sutures as kind of landmarks to describe where that fracture is. So they are worth knowing. So between the frontal and the parietal bones, um, that's the coronal suture that goes around the top. Um, where the parietal and temporal bones come together, that's the squamous suture because it's kind of flat. And then where the parietal and occipital bones come together, that's the lambdoid suture. All right. All right, so the bones of the skull are not solid. Now, the, the reason for that is probably twofold. One is it makes the skull lighter. You know, because um, there are air spaces in the larger bones of the skull, it means that the, the skull itself isn't as heavy. The other reason for it is um, uh, these spaces called sinuses provide a, a place for residence. You know, humans make a, a huge and wide variety of sounds. Um, you know, we have the most complicated, you know, linguistic and auditory language, you know, of the animals on Earth. And these air spaces allow um, um, our voices to have a more complexity and more ways they can be altered. So we have um, four sets of sinuses. Um, the frontal sinuses sit just above the eyes. Um, 
they are part of what gives us our um, our brow. You know, instead of having a flat forehead, we actually have this little ridge where our eyebrows live. And underneath that ridge is where the frontal sinuses are. <clears throat> In some of our skulls that have their uh, caps removed, you actually can see the frontal sinuses. They're not, they're sort of flat and broad. Um, uh, so that's the frontal sinuses. The ethmoidal sinuses are found in the ethmoid bone. Um, so they're here, um, one on each side. This uh, sphenoid bone has a sinus in the center of it. So that's the sphenoidal sinus here in uh, blue. And then the largest of the sinuses are found in the maxillary bone. Um, and they are, uh, so underneath uh, uh, both cheeks, just underneath the eyes, um, are the maxillary sinuses, and they're, they're the largest. Um, <clears throat> the, uh, these spaces are um, filled with mucous membrane, so lining these air spaces are the same kind of cells that you find uh, lining the respiratory tract. Um, so they're mucus producing cells. Um, the uh, sinuses play a role in resonance, like we talked about. They also help to um, humidify and uh, um, warm the air that we breathe. Interesting to note, we're not born with sinuses. Sinuses develop over time. So I've got a picture of a baby skull, and we've got a baby skull in lab two. And one of the most profound things you see is that in the infant skull, the maxilla is very flat and short. So as the maxillary sinus develops, that's one of the things that gives, you know, baby spaces are round, but adult spaces are oval. And part of that difference is the maxillary sinuses. All right. And then rounding out the bottom of the skull is the mandible, otherwise known as the jawbone. Um, it has a ramus and a body um, and an angle. So um, here's the angle. You can see that, you know, where it gets that because we have kind of an angle there. The ramus is this flat part that sticks up um, here and connects to the bottom of the skull. And then the body of the mandible is the part where the teeth are, so the, the rounded part um, in the center. There is a coronoid process and a condylar process. So the condylar process is what actually fits into the, uh, into the socket on the bottom of the skull um, that allows the jaw to move. And then the coronoid process is this triangular piece that sticks up here and it's where many of the important muscles attach. Um, so like the masseter muscle, which is one of our primary chewing muscles, it connects to the coronoid process so that when it contracts, it pulls the jaw up with great force, you know, so we can grind or chew uh, food. Um, here in the front of uh, on each side, you can see a little picture right here too, is the mental foramen. Now you might say, why is it called mental? Well, in Greek, the mentis is the front part of the chin. And the old story goes that people, that the more pronounced and pointy your chin was, the smarter you were in Greece, apparently. So that's the mental foramen is uh, uh, near that point of the jaw on each side. All right. And that's a little bit for that. Okay. And then uh, rounding out is the associated bones. So here's that hyoid bone that I talked about. Here's your Adam's apple, you know, that you can palpate. And up um, about two or three centimeters above that is where you're going to find the hyoid bone. So it's really where the floor of the mouth um, connects with the, what you think of as your throat. Um, so this hyoid bone is not connected to any other bone. Um, it's only connected to other muscles. Um, so there's a greater horn and a lesser horn, and it has this very simple round or U-shaped structure. Not a very interesting bone, the hyoid bone. Um, and then the auditory ossicles are very, very tiny, um, and they're found uh, connecting the external ear, the tympanic membrane, the eardrum, to the internal ear, um, or the uh, 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 part of the ear that actually does the hearing. But we'll see how those auditory ossicles work when we get to the um, special senses chapter. All right, so to review, we've got 14 facial bones, eight cranial bones, um, and the seven associated bones. All right, so the skull looks very different. Oops, I think I need to turn all those off, sorry. Um, in the infant, 
We all know about the soft spot. Well, the soft spot, there's actually two of them. That's what they're called fontanelles. And fontanelles are where um, sutures that have not formed yet basically converge. So in a baby, there's what we call the anterior fontanelle. That's the soft spot in the front. But then there's also a posterior fontanelle or an occipital fontanelle. Now, this one closes first. This one closes second. So even in a baby one year of age, you can often still find a, about a fingertip size uh, anterior fontanelle or soft spot. Um, and the uh, posterior fontanelle you can usually feel up until about four to six months. Um, so these are, uh, you know, the bones of the skull are forming. And remember, we talked last time, they form inside that fibrous membrane, right? You know, the skull starts out as kind of a leathery helmet that then bone grows inside of. Well, when the baby is born, not all the bone is finished growing. <clears throat> so the sutures, instead of being locked in tight together, are actually still open. You know, the bones of the baby's skull are not actually connected to each other, except by this fibrous membrane that um, the bone is forming inside of. So we still have all the same sutures. You know, we have the coronal suture between the frontal and parietal bones, the squamous suture between the temporal and parietal bones, lambdoid suture, sagittal suture up here at the top, um, and then the, the lambdoid suture there at the bottom. Um, so another uh, big difference is you can see how the maxilla is very, very small. So that means that the baby's skull is sort of round and long, and the adult, the face comes way down here. So the maxilla gets longer, and we go from um, a, a round face like this to a oval face like this in the adult. So when the baby is born, the, it's the widest part of the baby is actually this right here. So um, the, uh, uh, the circumference of the, uh, as, as basically, basically the uh, parietal bones and occipital bones define the largest part of the baby. So most babies are born posterior cranium first. So they sort of are born like this. Um, and they use their occipital and parietal bones uh, to uh, work their way through the birth canal. Right. So be sure to look at the infant skull and lab because it's kind of cool. All right, <clears throat> so enough about the skull. Moving on to the spinal cord. The, uh, the spinal cord is, um, we have cervical, uh, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae, and then uh, the sacrum and coccyx at the end. But important to note is there are four curves to the spinal cord, or the, spi the spinal column. Two are, we're born with, and two develop later. So we call them primary and secondary curves. Primary curves are there when you're born. Secondary curves develop later um, uh, in time. So the two primary curves are the thoracic and the sacral. And those are both convex. So remember, convex is to bow out. Concave is to bow in, right? Those are sort of uh, physics or math words. Well, the thoracic curve here, um, and the sacral curve here both bow out. <clears throat> We're born with those. <clears throat> the other two curves are concave. They bow in. So the cervical curve here and then the lumbar curve here both develop um, after uh, birth. So the cervical curve develops when the infant learns how to hold its head up. Um, so, you know, when babies are first born, of course, they, they don't have very good head control. And part of that is because they don't yet have a cervical curvature. So as, they, as the muscles that hold the head up mature, they develop that secondary curve of, of convex from what was a concave. And then the lumbar curve develops as the child learns to walk upright. So you know babies that are crawling um, have kind of a, a flat or a convex um, uh, lumbar spine. But when they start standing and sitting, then that secondary lumbar curve starts to form um, in that concave way. So if you look at a newborn baby, um, we're all born comma-shaped. You know, so 
there's only the primary curves. So you can see that we have just one big convexity. Now you can say this baby maybe does have a little bit of uh, cervical curvature, but certainly if you let him just rest, he won't. Um, it'll just be a nice comma shape. And then as they learn to control their heads, they get a cervical curvature, and then as they stand up, they get a lumbar curvature. Okay. You can get other abnormal curvatures too. So those four prime or four uh, curves, we two primary, two secondary, we all have those. So lumbar, um, sacral, cervical, and thoracic. But these are ones you're not really supposed to have. Um, so uh, in this one here, this is kyphosis, um, and this is where the thoracic curvature is exaggerated. So the humpback is the uh, vernacular for that. Um, this can occur with age um, due to osteoporosis. So sometimes you'll see little old ladies with kyphosis, and that's because their vertebral column has undergone compression fractures. You can get this one from poor posture. You know, the reason your moms and dads tell you to sit up straight all the time is to avoid kyphosis so you don't get hunched back. Um, in lordosis, the uh, lumbar curvature is exaggerated. In other words, the, uh, the, 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 the belly sticks out um, and there's a, a pronounced lumbar curvature. Now, in women who are pregnant, this is normal. It's called the lordosis of pregnancy. And basically, as the, the baby gets heavier and heavier, in order to keep the baby over mom's center of mass, she has to, to push her back um, back. So there's a lordosis that develops. And it's one of the causes of back pain in late pregnancy is this lordosis of pregnancy as mom is trying to balance the baby's weight on her own feet as the baby gets bigger and gets further out. And then scoliosis, probably every single one of you have been checked for at least once in your life, at least you should have. Um, this is a lateral curvature. So um, you can see that her shoulder blades are not uh, even. That's one classic sign. You can see that her scapula kind of sticks out on one uh, side and not the other. That also is a curvature. So this is a, uh, a curvature like this. So her back is sort of S-shaped. Um, and this is a, a relatively severe scoliosis in that one. So they will fix. They would fix that with surgery. Yeah? Is the lordosis similar to the spondylosis? Like, um, Ankylosing spondylitis? Is that what you're asking about? Um, no. It's like Spondylomela, I don't remember how to pronounce it, but it's it's the lumbar, it's an exaggeration of the lumbar curve. I'm not familiar with that one. Okay. You got me. <laughs> <laughs> I know about ankylosing spondylitis, which is a degenerative disease of the it's what, lumbar it's spine. What I have. That's what I was asking. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. It's like a, it's an exaggerated curve at the end there in the lumbar. Of the lumbar. Yeah, I'm not familiar with it. Sorry. Okay. All right. Okay, so which of the following bones is attached to the skull by muscles and ligaments? All right. All right, jump in there, last few people. There we go. All right, so it's unique because it's not, it's the only bone in the body that isn't connected to another bone, um, and that's the hyoid bone. So it's only connected by muscles and ligaments. It's, it's not, it has no direct uh, joint with another bone. All right. So which of these things is true? 
right, jump in there, last few. All right, well, let's look at them individually. Okay, so A, the cervical curve develops before birth. No, um, the thoracic and sacral curves are the primary curves. Those are the ones that you're born with. The cervical curve develops as baby learns how to hold their head up above their body. And the uh, lumbar curve develops as baby learns how to up, uh, walk upright. So the adult vertebral column has four, um, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral. Um, scoliosis is not a normal curvature. It's a lateral curvature. So in other words, off to one side or the other. Um, uh, kyphosis is, in fact, an exaggerated thoracic curve. So that one's true. And then lordosis is not a cervical curvature. It's an exaggerated lumbar curvature. All right. All right, so let's introduce the spine before we call it a day here. Um, so what we call the spine, or the spinal column, or the, the uh, vertebral column, is really uh, 26 different vertebrae that we divide into three regions. Um, so we have seven cervical vertebrae. Uh, we have uh, 12 uh, thoracic vertebrae here. We have five lumbar vertebrae. And then we have the sacrum. Now, originally, or initially, um, when we're born, the sacrum is actually five separate vertebrae. But as we reach puberty and into adulthood, the sacrum fuses into those five vertebrae become one solid bone. So they fuse together um, and form the shield-shaped sacrum. And then at the, uh, the very end of the sacrum is the coccyx. Now, the coccyx is the tailbone. Um, in animals that have tails, there are multiple coccygeal vertebrae that create that tail. You know, So when you're petting your dog and cat and you feel their tail, they have these little bones inside, and those are the, our, our coccygeal bones. Now, we don't have a tail, but we do have what's left of one, so we call that the coccyx. Um, the, each of these, uh, the vertebrae in each of these regions have different characteristics. And one of the things that you'll need to be able to do for both lab and lecture exam is to be able to discriminate a cervical, thoracic, and lumbar vertebrae. So they, they have their, and we're going to go through the characteristics of each, but I should be able to put a vertebrae down and you should be able to tell me whether it's cervical, thoracic, or lumbar. And it's not that hard because they are significantly different from each other, um, but that's uh, one of the, the things you got to know for the skeleton is to be able to discriminate um, the three. All right. So the um, <clears throat> vertebrae have, they all share some similar parts. So they have a big round part here. That's the vertebral body. That's where the weight is transferred. You know, the, the vertebral column has to carry all the weight of the top all the way into the legs. So there has to be a surface for that. So we have that. Um, there's an arch. This is the vertebral arch. Inside of that is where the spinal cord is. So that's the spinal canal. It sits inside the vertebral arches. Um, we have a transverse process that sticks out to the side, here and here. And then we have a spinous process that sticks out in the back. So when you run your finger down your spine, you feel those little uh, 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 bumps. Those are your spinous processes sticking out. Um, you can't really feel the transverse processes. A lamina, the lamina just connect the uh, spinous processes to the transverse processes. So here are the lamina. And then um, the vertebrae fit together. And how they fit together is a very sort of complex three-dimensional arrangement. Because the vertebrae have a lot of flexibility. You know, we can bend over and touch our toes. We can also twist our vertebrae to, to, to the left or to the right. Um, so there has to be lots of movement there. Where the vertebrae come together, they slide against each other on these articular facets. So in lab, I have a, a, a column of uh, vertebrae that when you get them all lined up right, um, will show you how the, the, uh, the vertebrae can actually slide and move against each other to be as flexible as they are. And then between the vertebral bodies, we have what are called intervertebral discs. So these are tough, fibrous uh, uh, discs that help to cushion and absorb um, shock, but also still allow for flexibility. All right, so let's call it a day right there, and uh, we'll pick up.
talking about specifics about vertebrae next time.